I'm Suzanne Murdoch and welcome to Series 3 of Powering Productivity. Each episode I explore the energy, the really genuine connections, expertise and being in your best flexible working environment can bring to you, your business and your whole life. So let's get started. Welcome. I'm your host, Suzanne Murdoch, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Joanne Mangan, who is the Employer's Lead with Grow Remote. Originally founded in 2018, the ethos of Grow Remote is really about enabling people to live and work wherever best suits them, and for communities across Ireland to become more sustainable and connected, both socially and economically. As Employer's Lead, Joanne engages with employers at every stage of their remote working journey, She manages the partnerships with Ireland's leading remote first organisations and helps employers who want to make that transition to remote or hybrid working. She's a regular media contributor on this topic and is passionate about the potential it can bring as a driver of equality, diversity and inclusion. Prior to joining the organisation, she worked for a number of multinational technology companies, managing distribution teams and enabling channel partners. So Joanne, welcome. It's lovely to have you here. I have to say I'm a huge supporter of the work you're doing with Grow Remote. Um, I'm a massive advocate of remote hybrid working, as you know. So delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Suzanne. Sorry, I'm very happy to be here. You're very welcome. Tell us a bit about your story today, Joanne, and how how you um, came about working with Grow Remote. Okay, so I've been with Grow Remote. uh, It's actually two years uh, almost to the day since I joined the team at Grow Remote, which has been just an amazing experience. Um, before I joined Grow Remote, as you said in your intro, I was working in the tech world, in the private sector, worked for a couple of different software companies, had my own experiences at the time of remote working, never very good. Um, I was managing a team and they decided to roll out remote working, but it was only available to top performers. So only maybe three or four people on the team and everybody else had to still go into work feeling very sorry for themselves and a little bit annoyed at how come this was available to them. So I had to manage all of that. And then another time I was working remotely uh, for another company and I wasn't allowed to tell anyone I was working remotely so for one day a week I just wouldn't be in the office and I wasn't able to tell anybody why and I'd be dialing in from meetings doing that thing of hello can you talk louder can you hear me so um, have had I've seen the other side of remote working I I came to a remote I took a career change I guess I left the software industry decided to take a year out and I I did a master's uh, on something completely unrelated which was gender globalization and human rights in NUIG, which was really amazing transformative experience for me, really opened my eyes to um, the changes that are needed in the world in general. And once I came out of that, I really didn't want to go back to the tech world. It's a great industry to work in, don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed it, but I was looking for something that had a social impact. And I saw the role with Grow Remote. Um, Hadn't even thought about working remotely, even though this was, the pandemic had already started at this stage. But I just really liked what they were doing. Uh, I really liked the mission. It just fit perfect with what I was looking for. And here I am two years later, still here. And what, I mean, fantastic timing to make a change like that as well with, with everything that's happened. And I guess it's not just remote working that's grown at such a rapid pace, but the technology side of it as well. And you've got, you've got both sides of that expertise. So fantastic move. Tell me, you, you touched on the ethos of um, Grow Remote, and we were talking about the word, uh, m- m- oh, I can't pronounce it, say the word for me. Mehel, Mehel, That's it's an word. Irish word, so yeah. I'll excuse you for not being able to pronounce it, it's not easy to pronounce, but it's Mehel. And it, and it tells you about the ethos of, of Grow Remote, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Mehel is an old Irish word, and it means um, people in the community coming together, it, it originated from harvest time, when people who had a harvest to, to work on um, wouldn't be able to manage the work on their own. So the community would get involved and they would help uh, to bring in the harvest. And that's the idea behind Grow Remote. It's bringing people in the community together for a greater purpose. Um, and that's behind everything that we do. So we are a community development organization at heart. And that's what we were founded to be. And that's what we still are today. Even though we've grown a lot, things have changed a lot since we since we started before the pandemic. But we still keep true to that idea of community development. For us, remote work is the biggest driver or potential driver of community development that there is. It's a a seismic change. I cannot, I don't have enough words to describe how transformational remote work could be for local communities because 
if you want to work, if you can work from anywhere, then you can live anywhere. And if you can live anywhere, then you can live in your local community. I live in Athen, right? Three years ago, I would not have been able to apply for many jobs that were advertised because they were Dublin and I didn't want to live in Dublin. But now I can advertise, I can apply for jobs and still live in Athen Rye. I can walk down, spend a little money locally. I can connect with people locally. I can take part in local activities. And that's what we're trying to drive with remote work. Remote work uh, gives people opportunities they didn't have before and it allows them to live and participate locally. Oh, it's, okay. it's amazing what you're doing. And then you work with the employer's side as well, helping them in terms of transi transition to hybrid working yeah. and helping yeah. them with tal talent attraction and, and retention. Can yes, that's... That... More... Yeah, so that is that is my role. Um, we're remote, we have three areas that we work on. So we have our community, which is uh, groups of chapters, we call them. These are groups of people all over Ireland. And actually we're in 17 countries. Um, including Ireland, but our biggest presence is in Ireland. And our chapters are all about that local activity, awareness of remote jobs um, and bringing people together socially. Then we have training. So we provide training for uh, companies, for individuals who are looking for remote, remote jobs and for employees who want to do really well remotely. And then we work with companies. So that's what I do. Uh, my, my role at Remote is to engage with companies, different types. So Companies who are already fully remote and have been fully remote for a long time and who know how to do it really well um, have all the best practices to share. Companies like Shopify, HubSpot, eBay, um, these are, are well-known remote companies and they were doing it long before the pandemic. So we partner with them and we learn everything we can from them and we share that as much as we can with others. And then we also work very closely with companies who are on the transition to remote. So for most companies, remote was forced on them in the pandemic without any education or training it was just it was a response to a crisis a necessity and it it was great because it helped companies keep their doors open their virtual doors at least um but now you know we're nearly about three years on companies are realizing it's really challenging it's a it's a huge transformation you're not just talking about okay let's all just move the office to the home and then we all just keep working as, as we were it requires a full change in your ways of working. And that's not easy, right? So we train companies, we support them, we provide them with guidance, consulting, resources, free resources, lots of stuff, um, events, activities like webinars and, and anything that we can do to share what we're learning from the companies I talked about, the Shopify's and, and the like, um, and share that so that others are able to make that journey um, as painlessly and as seamlessly as possible. No, I mean, you're right. We work, um, our flexible workspace here has a lot of remote workers who will work for corporates typically. And they all talk about the challenges that it's brought. It's not just literally um, the connectivity, but it's the culture side of things as well and keeping everyone together. And they might meet up in the office, say, once a week or once a month for those uh, for those important meetings, et cetera. But it's, it's really all about that workplace experience and the transparency of it and the continuity of it. So you must you must come across that a lot as well. Yeah, it's probably the biggest challenge that I hear from companies. Um, and I don't want to get it. I shouldn't go straight into the challenges, but it's it's really important to talk about the challenges because on a solution we, as well. Absolutely, hundred percent. And if we don't talk about them, we can't hear what others are doing. Then we can't figure out the solutions. Um, so the culture and that sense of connected to being connected to something is uh, a challenge that employers talk to me about every day and for a lot of them it's the reason why they do keep the offices open and they do ask people to come in a couple of days a week uh, because they think that you need that in-person um, collaboration connection and I, I understand why they would feel that way because that's the way we've always worked uh, you know we would argue that even though that's you know it's up to each company to decide themselves how they do it there are other ways to build connection and a sense of culture in a remote world it's just about educating companies and helping them along the way you it is also a misconception about remote work that i hear all the time that people think when we talk about remote work it means you never meet in person but we grow remote we have no offices we have a fully remote team but we still meet each other regularly it's just not in an office every week it's it's not this sort of structured predefined mandate it is very much thought out um, and with purpose. So we meet for our team retreats or we meet for maybe a team planning session or we, we do a co-working day. If we're living close by to another colleague, we might meet at a co-working hub. So there's lots of ways you can bring people together 
without necessarily having to bring everyone into the office one day a week. Now, if you want to bring everyone into the office one day a week, absolutely. If it works for you and it works for your employees, then that's absolutely fine. But we're just trying to get people to think a little bit differently about it and think about, well, why am I bringing people to the office? What are they doing when they come to the office? Are they just sitting on their computers writing emails? They could do that at home. So is that the best use? And the other thing, back to that idea of the opportunity for rural Ireland, if somebody still has to go to the office even one day a week, it does limit them in terms of where they can live. You still need to live within a reasonable commuting distance of the office. And the company still has to keep their offices open because there is a day a week where everybody's in there. So they're not getting the advantages like cost savings, being able to reduce their office footprint. And they're not getting, the employees are not getting the advantage in terms of no commuting and, and better work-life balance. So we're just we're just trying to educate companies. They're, we're not saying that they're... Um, Issues or questions or fears are wrong because they're not. We're all in a very early stage of learning what remote working is. We're just we're trying to educate a little bit more. We're trying to uncover these problems and then we're able to come up with the solutions. Yeah, it, it sounds very familiar to the feedback that we're getting here is that, yes, people might still go in, but they have to have that experience. You know, they have to earn the the um, the employers are having to earn the the, the time commuting to compute. You know, mm -hmm. we're hearing a lot, a lot of people aren't necessarily going in on Friday, for example. The ones that are traveling over to England is very much Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So they are getting into a more of a, a routine. And I think it's starting to work very well for, for both sides. But there's obviously still those niggles and the education side of things. What what are some of the, the trends that you're hearing in terms of days people are going in? How many are working hybrid as opposed to fully, fully remote? Can you can you give me a bit of a few stats maybe on that? Yeah, um, so hybrid does seem to be the most popular option. And um, even if you look at some of the research that's been put out there, there's a professor called Nick Bloom. He's a Stanford professor and he does a lot of work on researching remote. And recently he said that employers are more in favor of the hybrid model than any other. Um, from us, uh, anecdotally, from talking to companies that grow remote, which is something I do every day, there is still quite a good number of companies who are looking at fully remote. And, and we've had a few even approach me in, the, say, January. I've, I think I've had three different companies come to me, say they want to go fully remote. And how do they do that? So I think it's a mix. The larger companies who still have big offices are tending more towards keeping those offices and then maybe use, feeling like they have to use them or wanting to use them for some of the reasons I talked about earlier. And for them, it's a little more difficult to pivot to fully remote. There's, a, there's more complexity involved there. I think from a startup point of view, a lot of the startups now are starting up without an office. And why not? I mean, it makes total sense. You're going to save so much money if you don't have to lease a building. Uh, so it is very much in a state of flux. And anyone who tells you that we are you know, at this steady state when it comes to remote work, I think is wrong. I do think, though, this year is the year we're going to see the rubber hit the road and companies are going to start making decisions. Over the last two years, say the first year, it was, you know, remote as a, as a crisis management option. And um, nobody was really thinking about the future. It was just, let's just get through this. Then as we moved into the offices reopening, it became very experimental. Companies, you know, co companies we work with, e ESB is a good example. They're one of our partners. They talk about their year of learning. Last year was their year of learning. Trying out this model, trying to see about bringing people back or not, or, or the how much time was needed. Um, uh, but now I think the time for experimenting is is over because you need continuity, you need clarity, employees need clarity and want clarity. Um, we're moving to closer to the legislation on the right, right to request, which means employees can then request remote working. And employers are in a bit of a tricky spot. I, I do feel for um, employers, I have a lot of empathy because they may want to have people in the office one day a week. Um, and the employees would have said, yes, we're happy with that. And I know a lot of companies who surveyed their employees and employees said, yes, we're very happy with one day a week. But when it actually came to it, compliance with that, that rule or that mandate is just not happening. Employees are not coming in. And I've seen employers do ice cream trucks and family days and all this stuff, trying to encourage people come back to come back in. And they're just not. And what does an employer do then? Do they force everyone back? You don't want to do that, right? Because then you're going to have, how do you, how do, you do that? Um, or do they go more flexible? And so that's why I think employers are at this decision point now. Do they go more? Do they go all in? More flexibility. Still can keep the office. Obviously, you don't need to give up the office. But 
make it more optional, more choice, more flexibility for the employee? Or do they bring everyone back in full time? I think that's where we're at right now. No, I agree. And then they've also got the state of flux with skill shortages in a lot of scenarios there with talent attraction and retention. So they have absolutely that that flexibility as well and, and carry it through. I know we've seen a lot of employments who are advertising it in certain job descriptions, but not following through. Yeah, that is really common. Process. Yeah, big problem for job seekers. Um, it's very hard to see. I did a search on LinkedIn recently doing a little bit of research and I searched for jobs remote EMEA, so the um, Europe, Middle East and Africa region, which would be our time zone. And there were 150,000 jobs open that were uh, remote EMEA. Now, not all of those jobs are available to people in Ireland, right? Some of them are specifically for a country, for example, it might be Germany or Spain, but a lot of them are, right? So but then when I started looking into them, so many of them had a location specified or it wasn't clear. I couldn't tell, is this actually a remote job that I can apply for or is it not? And job seekers are telling us that as well. I've heard cases where, um, you know, an employee might think the job is, would, would understand 100% remote or fully remote to mean people never meet in person. Back to what I was saying earlier, that's a common misconception. Whereas then going through the interview process, it emerges that there is a team retreat, like we do at Go Remote, or there's a, a some events that they have to go to. And for some employees, that's a bit of a deal breaker because they they rightly or, or wrongly think remote fully remote means fully remote. So there's all these misunderstandings. And I think it's amazing. You know, it's it's three years later almost since the pandemic started. And we've been doing remote work for so long, but it, it's so surprising to me. It's There's such a lack of understanding about the fundamentals of what is remote work? What is hybrid work? What do I understand as a, as a job seeker versus the person advertising the job as the employer remote to be? And I think there's so much more education and awareness that needs to be built around that. Much more clarity should be put into job descriptions, but employee expectations as well, I think, have to adjust because it has to work for business. Um, and you mentioned retention and, and, and attracting talent, very important. And even though things have slowed down a little bit in, in that area, companies are still looking for talent. So they have, but they have to balance that with this need for uh, what's working for the business. So it's a, it really, there's really so much more work to be done there in terms of what the employee thinks that, they, um, that remote work means to them, what an employer thinks it means, even companies that we've worked with that have been doing remote for a long time behind closed doors would express their frustration at this that it's so unclear what it means to be hybrid what it means to be remote first versus remote versus 100 percent remote it's a it's a minefield yeah no I know I completely agree and I think that for me there's the whole sustainability side of things not in terms of the green side but more the energy as well you've got all these individuals working flexibly remotely hybrid um, and you they have to be able to sustain that energy that creativity regardless of whether they're in the office, working remotely from home, working from a co-working space, for example, and, and really balancing, you know, where is their best working environment? Where can you get your optimum energy from? Yeah. So there's, so there's, the, there's the individual approach as well that the employers and the employees have to balance when they're thinking about this. There's so many different things to think about. There is, and a lot of people really like meeting people face-to-face, -face, and some a lot of people really don't like doing that. Um, and up to now, the office has been very much built for the extrovert. The office is, is founded on, on, you know, an idea of um, a, very, a person who can do the nine to five or nine to six or nine to seven um, and doesn't have outside responsibilities like caring responsibilities, for example, and is an extrovert who loves being one around the whiteboard and loves chatting to people at the water cooler. Not everybody is like that. Some people are do their best work at home or in a, in a hub or remotely where they can think, they're not disturbed, they can have focus time. So it is um, the, the personalization and individualization of work is the future of work. Again, how you do that gets tricky because it, it you don't want, employers don't want it to be a free for all. You know, an employer would think, oh my God, how do I manage that? How do I manage different working models for different people? But it, it's about just, letting go of the old system to me the office office working is is the old system it's it's like analog <laughs> we're we're in a new world now and you can't just expect to plonk the want of a better word just throw remote work into the mix and expect it all to work you know you're not if you get a I, i'm going to use an analogy i was trying to think of something this morning because i was i was really thinking about this um 
if you think about you get a HD box for TV, you know, like and it, it's supposed to give you a great picture, but then you plug it into a crappy old TV, then your picture is not going to be great. So it's yeah, the same yeah. idea. This is change the system. You need to change the underlying norms, policy structure of how we work. I'd love to be able to tell you I had all the answers of how to do that, but I don't. But there's a lot of creative people working on that. And that that's the future of remote working, of, of work. It's thinking differently, letting go of the old structures, thinking about the new ways of doing things. And thinking differently about how you measure output as well. It's not just when people are in the office, when they're turning up, how many days have they worked. Think about the output. Look at that. 100%. Measure it in different ways as well. And you're Absolutely. Right. I would be an introvert. I'm not always good um, working certain projects in the office. I like to, I mean, I'm lucky enough that I have that choice so I can work in different environments depending on what I'm doing and the mood I'm in. I am lucky. I admit mm. not everybody has that flexibility, I guess. So it's no. just fi finding sensible ways around it and balancing that, um, measuring pros and cons for employer, employee. But yeah, individuality is a, is a big thing, I think, going forward. And it's it's almost the new commodity is, is choice and flexibility, I guess. It is. And to me, it's a very inclusive way of thinking about the workplace, because if you, again, the person who can work long hours, um, be at their desk, work through lunch, still be there late to do late meetings, do that networking stuff in the evening, maybe with the boss. Um, not everybody can do that. You know, it's, it's a subset of the population because people have as I mentioned, caring responsibilities. You've got parents, you've got people looking after elderly relatives, you've got people with hidden illnesses, disabilities, neurodivergencies. I could go on and on, you know, not everybody fits into that box. So I think the individualization of, of work is going to be a great thing in terms of bringing more people into the workforce and enabling them to be really successful and grow their careers as well. Because in the past, asking to work remotely was kind of seen as you didn't care about your career. So we need to change. So that's what I mean about changing the norms. We need to make it a norm that remote work does not mean you don't care about your career. Um, and you mentioned outputs that you know we need to change that norm. The norm was the longer you were sitting at your desk, the more you were perceived as being a hard worker or more committed to your job. We need to change that. It's not about that. It's about what you're producing. It's about your output. Yeah, yeah, completely. And the, there's so many different. There's four generations. I was reading an article about um, reverse mentoring, and now we've four generations. <laughs> you know, in, in different workspaces, it's never happened before. So you've all of those skill sets and expertise and marrying those up as well. And that can be done remotely in the office. So I think, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a, an awful lot we've got to work with now. Um, I'm, I'm just wary of time. I'd love to talk a little bit about the community side of, of sure. Grow Remote Does and how that really benefits people, especially in rural areas. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. As I said, that's that's what we were founded on. And um, we had this before my time now, but at, at the start, Grow Remote was just a bunch of community people who got together thinking about how remote work could benefit. And actually, we're very forward thinking when you think about it, because this was pre-pandemic. Everyone thought they were mad, right? They 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 really were seen as being a little bit off, off the wall of coming up with this idea, uh, which totally makes sense now, but at the time was quite innovative. And the community, so our community is made up of groups of people all over the country. We've over 200 chapters. So in every, you know, in every town around Ireland, you could find a Grow Remote chapter, which is a group of, of individuals living in that uh, area who are very passionate about developing and growing and thriving, making their community a thriving one. Um, and the way they're doing it is they're spreading the word locally about remote jobs that are available because people still don't know about them. I was actually on a session yesterday with a group of people and we asked them how did they know how many remote jobs were open in their area and they were coming back with ones and twos and then we we mentioned the 150,000 and they were absolutely blown away by this they could not believe that this now as I said that number may not be as high but you're still talking about in the thousands that could be done from where they were living so it's awareness that's what our, our community do they, they create awareness if you think about it Remote jobs aren't advertised in the local paper. You're not going to, I live in Athen Rye, right? So we get the Galway advertiser. I'm not going to see a, a remote job from Shopify advertised in that paper. So how do we get the word out there? And that's what our chapters do. They let people know uh, they're kind of the equivalent of a notice board in the shop about jobs, but they're a physical embodiment of that. Um, they also, social isolation is one of the biggest killers of remote work. So we need to be able to bring people together. Um, we're humans, we're social beings, we want to meet and interact for the most part. 
with others and it's really important so they bring people together for events and if you go onto our website it's growremote.ie and just forward slash community will bring you into our community page and you'll be able to see all the events that are happening near your local area they do everything i mean there is just regular meetups like coffees a couple of drinks on a friday evening there's hiking hill walking we did a huge um event uh, initiative around culture night which was back i think it was september where we ran i think it was something like 200 cultural events all around the country music and art and theater it was fantastic so there's always something happening so um that and that's part of it is bringing people together we're even though we're all about remote work which is digital and virtual we're also all about offline connections and that's i think what makes us a little bit unique because you don't always think about that when you're thinking about remote work sometimes it's just about the nuts and bolts of how we do it but actually the other side of it is how do we keep people, people connected um and another area of another um area that our our chapter leads work in is re-energizing the town so it attracting people back to the town we have a, a great example up in Donegal Aranmore Island they put up a call, put out a call for people to come back to the area and I think they were able to attract back 40 sorry for, I think it's like 40 people maybe something like that for a population of about 500 they were able to keep the school open which you know it's really that is the kind of impact you can have you bring some people back to the area and they have good jobs that creates more jobs locally. Again, there's a statistic, every remote job that's created in, in a local town generates one to two other jobs remotely because are in, in the town because people are shopping and they're um, able to set up their own businesses because there's more people there to, to purchase their services or goods. So it really has that the community aspect of what we do is very transformational. Without that, we wouldn't be able to do what we're trying to do because we don't have that reach to be able to get into every town in village in Ireland. So they're really critical to our overall mission. And and that's going to have a domino effect on towns as well. I mean, you're bringing the skills, expertise, that in turn is going to make new jobs. And I think for me, when we were working, certainly working at home through the pandemic, it's it, it's those niggly questions that you might have going through your mind that you haven't got anyone to ask. And actually, they can become big, big challenges and, and issues in your head if you haven't got that person to bounce ideas off of. So... Yeah, for me, for me, community communities are absolutely massive, mm. and and having those skill sets and and expertise and the contacts as well. I mean, you could, in effect, create a number of jobs from that side mm. of things. I know I was absolutely. doing some of the the chapter lead um, training with Donal there yeah. before Christmas. Fantastic opportunity. I'm really keen, really keen to grow that here actually. And I know there's a few chapters in Northern Ireland. Um, and I know that you also have a few um or partnerships that you work with in the Republic. Um, through Grow Remote and Connected Hubs you work a lot with as well don't you? Yeah yeah. I just wondered is there are there any partnerships that you work with across Northern Ireland and are you looking to grow um, grow this side? So you're right we we have chapters in uh, Northern Ireland actually Donal Kearney who is our, um, our our community manager and he, he would have been with you on when you did the training I'm delighted to hear you did the training by the way the chapter lead training is fantastic and it's all about enabling those people then to play it forward and, and do all those things I talked about to have that impact locally. Um, so Donna um, is very involved in our chapters in Northern Ireland and, and we have, we call them remote advocates um, and we also have local leaders. So remote advocate is someone who just wants to help out in some way or another. There's nothing really strict about it. They can maybe just write a blog or, or do a post or something like that about remote work. And then we have local leaders as well, like your, the training that you did, which is about leading a, trap, a chapter. And we have those in Belfast. We have them in County Down, in Sainfield and Hillsborough um, and in Dundrum and County Down. So it's really, it's becoming more active in Northern Ireland. Uh, Donal has, has told me a little bit about the Down chapter. Um, they're all, they really want to foster more connection locally and build a community around the local remote workers. Um, it's led by a guy called William Redpath and, yeah, and a group yeah, of I, others. I know you, know, you know William, yeah. So yeah. they're doing great. They're doing a lot of great um, activities. They had a networking event there in Stormont in January. I think uh, they had coffee and networking another time. They had mince pie at Christmas. So just getting to know each other, trying to figure out what they can do to um, to bring the the, the awareness to the, their area. Um, we don't have partnerships yet, but we are, I, I think I can safely say this year, 2023 is looking to be a big year for Grow Remote in Northern Ireland. Um, and if anyone's interested in the events, 
There is one in February. It's in Newcastle and County Down in the Wild Hair Pub. So do come along and take a look at our website to see what else is coming up. But definitely uh, lots of opportunity for us to grow in Northern Ireland and, and a big appetite to do that too. Brilliant. And I know there's a lot of um, employers across Northern Ireland who would be advocating for, for remote work as well. So no, that's really good news. And I guess are there are a couple of case studies, um, people that you've worked with that you could tell us a little bit more about yeah, um, I give you a couple of examples. So we, um, eBay is probably a great example of a company that we've worked with very closely, and they've been involved with us since the very beginning. Um, I guess I, to me, they would be very pioneering in terms of remote working. You know, way ahead of others. They were they started looking at remote work back in two thousand seventeen, and they rolled it out with initially started with a group of thirty people in Dublin and trialing it out and then they expanded that to 200 um now their whole customer support team is remote and they're looking at other roles as well becoming more remote um they've had some great results uh impact wise one of the best from our point of view is since they made the move to remote a massive percentage of the employees and the job seekers who come to them are outside of leinster and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Le Dublin or Leinster, but it's great to see that that unlocking of jobs has led to more opportunity for people outside of that normal sort of traditional area because eBay have their offices in Dublin. Um, they've seen great results in terms of their productivity, no no impact, no negative impact on productivity. And um, things like their employee satisfaction scores are really high. So they're also brilliant supporters for remote and we were so grateful to them and their support. Siobhan Curtin is their country manager. She will come, you know, speak at an event with us. The, some of them have come through our training. They actually hired, they took on a, a Ukrainian group, a group of Ukrainian re refugees. It's They have a program called Stepping Stones. And um, they came to us looking for some help with the training. And we, we brought them through our Thriving Remotely training program. So it's a brilliant example of a company working with a social enterprise and supporting a social enterprise um, and having a real impact on people's lives as a result of making remote work available. Fantastic. So I was going to ask you, could you give me some top tips, just general top tips for, for, for remote working, if you're new to it? So for a worker, a remote, for a person, an employee, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Give me give me a couple for each, for employee and an employer. Okay, I think for an employee... It is important to understand your own working style. Um, how do you like to work? So, for example, I know I'm really good first thing in the morning and I'm really terrible after three o'clock. If you come to me after three o'clock, my motivation is gone. My energy is gone. I have all my energy in the morning. So I try to schedule a focus time in the mornings if I, if I want to get something do, done. Uh, so that's one. So to know yourself, when do you like to work? Don't try to force it. If, you, if you're working on a presentation and it's five o'clock in the evening, give it up. Come back to it in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> if you're like on me. That one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and vice versa. If you're an evening person, some people are, my, I have a friend who does her best work at 11 o'clock at night, which to me is just, I don't know how, because I can hardly speak at that time, but she's, she's flying at 11 o'clock. So same as that. And you can be flexible with your, with your, well, if the company allows it, which hopefully they do, you can be more flexible in your time. So you can take a block of time off in the middle of the day. If your slump is from, you know, two, two to four, then take that time off, go for a walk. Don't be so, you know, back to that whole thing. It's don't try to just plug remote into the existing system. You don't have to do your lunch at 12. So be a bit more flexible with that, obviously, if your employer allows it. Um, meeting free days, I block meeting free Wednesdays or whatever day suits and I put it in my calendar. And for the most part, I don't take meetings on a Wednesday. And that gives me a full day of focus time because you can get very interrupted. People tend to just stick meetings in your calendar um, or still default, and I'll, I'll come to this with the employers, still default to the idea that we need to jump on a meeting every time we want to figure something out or get something done. So block off your time and be as strict as you can about it. And if somebody asks for a meeting, say, I'm sorry, I don't do meetings on a Wednesday, uh, if you can, and use that time then for focus time. Um, take regular breaks. It's really easy, if, especially I work alone at home um my daughter doesn't come home from school till four and there's been times where I literally look up from my laptop at four when she's coming in the door and I realize I haven't taken a break all day and that's not good practice so I think um make sure you get your breaks go out for a walk I have a dog so I take it out for a walk at lunch 
um, and make sure that because you can very easily overwork um, and forget to get up and move around. Um, I also think a great skill for a remote worker is being able to communicate in writing. Um, I talk about this a lot and it doesn't mean you're able to write big, long essays or really long emails, but just being able to be very clear in what you're asking for, because a lot of communication in remote working is written, whether it's chat or on Slack or in an email. And I've seen so many cases where there's over and back and over and back, even just trying to organize a meeting with someone where it just takes forever because the, the conversation, it, it's like, let's meet on Thursday. And then the person writes back, I can't meet on Thursday. And then you go back going, well, when can you meet? <laughs> and this is three emails later. So just very simple things. Here are some times I'm available. This time, this time, and this time. If that doesn't suit you, suggest some times that you're available. <laughs> and just think about condensing the communication and making it really, really clear. So that's employees. Um, for employers, I would say... Same as I was saying to the employee, don't, if you can, again, not every business can allow this, but if you can, don't, you don't have to stick so rigidly to somebody being online at nine in the morning and checking to make sure they're still online at five. It's about a culture of trust. And if you give the right um, objectives, if you work with your employee to build a set of objectives, of outputs, and then they achieve those, does it really matter if they were at their desk at nine in the morning and they're still at their desk at five? So I think try and let go of that idea of micromanaging and monitoring um, and look at embedding a culture of trust. And to me, that's really important. Back to what we were saying earlier about employers are worried about culture. Culture is not necessarily a place. It's not, you know, foosball tables and ice cream. Culture is how you feel when you're doing work. So if you can make your employees feel trusted, isn't that the best culture you can build? Culture of trust is, is better than, you know, a fun culture where people are socializing all the time, for example. Um, look at being remote first, no matter whether you're in an office or hybrid or in a hub or whatever you're doing. And by that, I mean, you, you set up your processes and your policies as if everyone is remote, even if they're not. So maybe a better word for it is digital first. Um, and that way, if you, so, so if you build your, your policies, your communication policy, for example, your meetings, around the idea of remote first, making sure that that meeting is inclusive for everybody. So if people are dialing in and some people are in the office, very simple stuff you can do, like make sure everyone's dialed in on their own device, um, that people at home are, who are working from home can, can be heard, that they have opportunities to speak, that you have somebody ma monitoring the meeting so that they're watching if someone has their hand raised or something is in the chat so that you're making sure it's inclusive. Um, so being remote first is probably the number one for employers who want to make that transition to remote. If you're not remote first, there's a massive risk that your remote employees are going to be at a disadvantage in terms of access to information, access to opportunity, access to time with the boss. So you need to shake things up. That whole office first approach isn't going to work if you have some of your workforce working from home. So make sure people get time with the boss even if they're working from home, do it virtually, that they have access to information, put everything in a central location, single source of truth, make videos and send them out so that everyone has it. Just be always thinking of being inclusive and having that remote first approach. Very wise words. Thank you. Of, no, I got a lot out of that. Okay, Joanne, so, so where can people learn more about you and Grow Remote? Yeah, so they can go on our website, Suzanne. It's uh, www.growremote.ie. And they can also find us on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, and we're on Facebook. Um, but the website's probably the first best place to go. Anyone who wants to contact me directly, my email is joanne, that's J-O-A-N-N-E, -N -E, at growremote.ie. Happy to hear from anyone, and I'll, I'll pass it on to the right person if it's not for me, if it's community related, for example. But you know, we, we're happy to speak to whoever comes our way. We're, we're always looking to connect with others. So feel free to reach out anytime. No, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Joanne. And I really do encourage people to, to get in contact with you, Grow Remote. Fantastic work that you're doing. Big ad. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thanks for listening. You can find more information in the show notes or on our website, thehubnewry.com. While you're there, why not join our mailing list so we can keep you in the know about everything we're up to. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen so you don't miss an episode. Powering Productivity is presented by me, Suzanne Murdoch. It's produced by Emily Crosby Media.